Hello, how are you? Um, the other week I was standing in for an obs and gynae surgeon, an ONG surgeon. Um, that is obstetrics, uh, pregnancy and childbirth, gynaecology, women's reproductive health. I wasn't standing in for his clinical stuff, I was standing in for his teaching. Because remember, I'm not an MBBCH, I'm a BSc PhD. I don't do medical advice, I'm just teaching anatomy, I'm doing science. Anyway, back to my original point. Some of the anatomy I was teaching were two blood vessels that are very important to ONG uh, consultants, and those are the uterine artery and the ovarian artery. And I remember I've had lots of conversations with him about this before in the past, and I thought we'd cover that anatomy now because it's really, really important to women's health. So we're going to be doing pipe cleaners <laughs> because we've got to make some of these blood vessels. Um, and we are going to look at the uterine artery which is in the pelvis and see where it comes to from, see where it runs. We better introduce the other female pelvic organs and follow it out. And then we'll have a look at the ovarian artery, see where that comes from in the abdomen, follow it down, see what it does, see what structures it goes past. And those two anastomose, they, they meet up, they link pretty, very directly. Um, and this means that there is redundancy in the blood supply. Remember, we're talking about the female pelvis here. So the uterus is a very, very special organ. Every month it goes through a cycle of change and that also affects its blood supply. And of course, during pregnancy, it gets a lot larger and has a huge draw on blood supply. And much of that blood supply comes from the uterine artery, um, but it's kind of backed up by the ovarian artery on either side. All right then, these are the organs of the female pelvis. Um, back here is the rectum, that's most posterior. There's the vertebral column there and the spinal cord. This is anterior then, there's the pubis bone. So posteriorly we see the rectum and then we see the uterus. In this case, it's antiverted, it's folded anteriorly over the bladder. Uh, this is the vagina then connecting the uterus to the outside and the bladder will have the urethra in it somewhere and if I tilt this over or even if I split this apart we can see uterus, vagina, bladder, urethra, rectum but if I tilt it over we can see out here so this is in the lateral wall of the pelvis here there's the ovary and we have the uterine tube running out to it from the uterus to the ovary, which is what's going to collect the eggs, the ova, and transport them back to the uterus. The other tubes we see around here are ligaments. So we have a round ligament uh, and we have a, an ovarian ligament. Uh, those are anchoring these structures in place, giving some support. But there's actually um, the peritoneum of the abdomen so the peritoneum that lines the abdomen, wraps around all the gastrointestinal tract structures, that drapes, that's draped here over these pelvic structures. And that's what this white line is, this white covering. So in fact, as that's draped over these structures here, it forms something called the broad ligament. The broad ligament is one of those difficult things to identify and define, but it's like a whole bunch of structures running around here. The peritoneum drapes over it. So of course, if you lift it up, you kind of get some, some funky sheets of peritoneum and connective tissue. We just call it the broad ligament. The reason all that's important is because the blood vessels are in there. All right, which one should we do first? Should we do the, the uterine artery? Okay, here we've got the female pelvic organs again down here in the pelvis. We've taken all the structures out of the abdomen. Oh, we can't see the bit I wanted to see. Oh, genius. I'll get another one, back in a minute. All right. So I, this is actually a male pelvis because I can see a prostate gland in there. Anyway, but the point I wanted to make was, here's the abdomen. We've removed everything. What's left here are some of the retroperitoneal structures. 
This is the, as in, you know, I said that everything inside the abdomen is inside the peritoneum. So if we take the bag of the peritoneum out and all the gastrointestinal tract structures, we describe these, forget the spleen, that's another story, but we describe these structures as being retroperitoneal, posterior to the peritoneum. Um, one of the most important structures is this. This is the aorta, so the abdominal aorta. And as it descends, it ends as the common iliac arteries, and then as the common iliac arteries descend, they divide into external and internal iliac arteries. The external iliac artery will run down to the lower limb, supply blood to the lower limb, thigh, leg, that sort of thing. But it's the internal iliac artery that we're interested in today. And actually, it's, it's a very short branch because the internal iliac artery forms as the common iliac artery ends by bifurcating into two. It runs into the pelvis um, and then it divides pretty much straight away. So the internal iliac artery divides into the anterior trunk and there's a posterior trunk. And it's the anterior trunk that's going to give us the uterine artery. The other structure to notice on here, well, there's a few, and well, we'll come back to the other model probably, but this muscle here is psoas major, major muscle of the posterior abdominal wall. Pretty good landmark. And also we have these two ureters running from the kidneys down to the bladder. Ah, okay. Now, I said there's the vagina and there's the uterus. It gets a little bit more difficult to describe now. With anatomy, we always have to take things away to show things, so we've we've kind of we've taken this side away, but um, imagine there's the common iliac artery becoming the internal iliac artery. So imagine that happening on this side. We have the anterior trunk, which is going to give off a number of branches, and one of those branches is the uterine artery. So the uterine artery is going to run to so from kind of the wall towards the the vagina and the uterus. So it'll run to where the vagina meets the uterus, so around the region of the cervix out here, and it'll send a branch off inferiorly, so it'll give off vaginal branches, but the uterine artery itself is going to run kind of, yeah, that's a bit long, but around the lateral uterus, giving off uterine, well, helicine arteries, very, very wiggly arteries we, 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 um, to the uterus to supply it with blood, which makes sense because if the uterus is something that's going to get bigger, wiggly arteries can cope with that change in size. It's not good to stretch arteries and veins. So the uterine artery runs around here, giving off helicine arteries to the uterus. Now this is where the uterine tube or the fallopian tube has been cut along with other structures. And the uterine artery then is going to run out with that uterine tube. So it's going to run out in there. Whoops, something like that. Something not like that at all. But anyway, we've got to use our imagination a bit when we're using pipe cleaners and stuff, right? Um, but the, the uterine artery is going to run out to the ovary. So it's going to run back out laterally again. Um, and it's going to give off branches to the uterine tube, tubal branches, and it's going to give off branches to the ovary. Um, and there's a phrase that we use, uh, water passes under the bridge. So as the uterine artery is passing around here to the ovary, here's the ureter here. So the u, u <laughs> we've got a lot of we've got a lot of similar letters here, so we've got to be careful. The uterine artery passes over the ureter. That is, the u uterine artery is anterior medial to the ureter. And if I put that down for a moment, um, you remember I said that the peritoneum is is covering over all this. Well, the uterine artery is actually running in the broad ligament out to the ovary. So we wouldn't see it in the way that I showed with the pipe cleaner. It would be underneath this peritoneum running in the pelvis. So it's inferior to the peritoneum, retroperitoneal, whatever you like, want to think about it. It runs out to the ovary 
inside the broad ligament. Okay, uterine veins are going to follow the same route and of course they'll be draining to the internal iliac vein, common iliac vein and inferior vena cava, but they're more likely to be paired and there's a significant venous plexus in this region draining many of these structures. Plexus is like lots of wiggly blood vessels, lots of wiggly veins kind of all joined up together in a seemingly random order, but not really. Got it? Okay, so that's, that's the uterine artery. Okay, back to this one and moving on to the ovarian arteries. Here's the aorta again, as we saw earlier, it's been cut off here, but the aorta gives off two lateral branches. So this is usually about the L2, L3 vertebral level. Um, there's the superior mesenteric artery, so it's inferior to that. These are the kidneys, so these are the renal vessels, it's inferior to that. So this is where the ovaries started to develop in the embryo, and they descended to their final location in the pelvis. And as they descended, they trailed their blood supply behind them and their lymphatic drainage. So the ovarian artery runs from the aorta, and on the right side it runs anterior to the inferior vena cava, and then it descends, sorry it's truncated here, but, but bum, you know, with the magic of pipe cleaners, we can kind of maybe show where it's going. Um, it runs down to the ovary. Now, again, here's the ureter. So the ovarian artery is again crossing the ureter and it's running anterior to the ureter. So again, the water goes under the bridge. Um, and then it runs down to the ovary and the ovary is actually anchored by a suspensory ligament or the suspensory ligament of the ovary. So the ovarian artery is going to run in that suspensory ligament to get down to the ovary down there. Um, so it will give off some ureteric blood vessels to supply to the ureter as it goes past. And as it descends, and look, at there's that psoas major muscle I was talking about. So this is all anterior to psoas major, that hip flexor muscle, that major muscle in the posterior abdominal wall. So it's all anterior to that. Uh, runs the, the ovarian artery runs down to the ovary in the suspensory ligament and gets to the ovary, gives off ovarian branches, and will also supply blood to the uterine tube, the fallopian tube. So it's going to give off tubal branches. And when it gets there, the, the uh, ovarian artery will meet very directly the uterine artery. So there is a significant anastomosis here. There's a link between these two arteries. There's a, a significant redundancy. All right. And if we grab this model, there's the ovary there. There's the ureter. Um, and look, that is the, what we've got here is we've got the ovarian artery and, again, the ovarian veins follow the same route, but they're fairly likely to be a pair of veins on either side. And that's what we see here. We see a pair of ovarian veins running with the ovarian artery in the suspensory ligament of the ovary to get to the ovary and the uterine tube. The ovarian veins, well, actually, on the right side, run back to the inferior vena cava, and on the left side, run back to the left renal vein, most of the time, in most people. So the arteries tend to come from the aorta in most people, but they can come from the renal arteries or other nearby arteries in maybe up to 20% of people, so there's a fair bit of variability here. Okay. And then you've got to imagine that continuing as the ovarian artery and the uterine artery meeting. Now, people sometimes struggle with anastomosis. They think, well, which, which way is the blood flowing? And of course, when we, when we do something like this, or we make something like this, what we don't see are all the tiny blood vessels, the branches, the arterioles that are coming from these arteries. Um, and going to capillary beds in the tissue. So blood is flowing down the artery. So blood is actually flowing in both directions, the ovarian artery and the uterine artery towards one another. And that blood is then actually flowing out through smaller vessels to capillary beds 
and then the venous side of that capillary bed is collecting that blood and passing it back either through the ovarian veins or the uterine veins and, and so on. So this, this is a major anastomosis, a major link. This is not something that happens in the male pelvis. So that anatomy is really important to normal uterine function, um, to pregnancy, childbirth, surgery, and not just big surgeries like hysterectomy, but also postpartum hemorrhage. So bleeding after childbirth um, can be um, stopped by finding, probably not, not, not the uterine artery itself, but the, the branches from it um, and embolizing them to, to close them. And embolizing those arteries can also be a way of treating uterine fibroids and that sort of thing. But that concept of those two arteries coming together and giving significant redundancy to the female pelvic organs is an important idea and some, again, <laughs> a very cool anatomy. Right, that's it. See you guys next week.